for our first panel of the day on the nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament landscape. Uh, as some of you will have noticed, I'm not Anna Alexandru, who unfortunately can't be with us today. Uh, my name's Juliana Zeus. I work as part of the military science uh, team here at RUSI, and I focus on space. And we have a presentation on that as well, so not that badly placed, I hope. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to briefly introduce our wonderful panelists uh, today. We will start with uh, Zara Bunsen, who's a research and policy associate at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, ISD, and a member of the Young Deep Cuts Commission. Then we'll go to Lucy Millington, who's a graduate physicist at the Atomic Weapons Establishment. And last but not least, we've got Liv Mudala Baz, who's a student at King's College London. We've got some really exciting presentations uh, this morning. We'll start with uh, disinformation operations and their potential to undermine disarmament measures before we talk about the utility or the non-utility of breakout times. And lastly, uh, but never least, uh, st strategic stability in the context of space. Uh, now, just for you all to know, uh, we have this space until quarter past 11, so uh, we do have 45 minutes for the presentations and then 30 minutes for Q&A, so make sure you think of questions uh, as we go about the presentations. And please remember, presentations are on the record, but the Q&A is without attribution. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Sarah for the first presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. and. Uh, uh, welcome to my presentation on information operations on social media and the implications for nuclear regimes and treaties. Right. To get started, I argue that information operations influencing and manipulating the online discourse risk undermining nuclear non-proliferation, disarmament and arms control efforts as they distort the informational en environments across treaty life cycles from negotiating to verifying commitments. I want to note that this is a developing research space with little data or academic research on the nexus between online information environments and nuclear issues. For this presentation, I reviewed recent studies on the use of social media for information manipulation, and I also conducted a qualitative narrative analysis on Twitter. And here I focused on Russian, Chinese, and Iranian accounts, given those countries' interests and strategic use of the informational domain. Drawing from my findings, I will conclude with formulating recommendations to NATO allies' intelligence communities, as well as strategic communication teams. To give a bit of a conceptual background, I, this presentation considers information operations as referring to overt and covert techniques for influencing events and behavior of foreign countries. So, such efforts are rooted in Soviet active measures, which also involved the overt distortion of the information environment through officially sponsored foreign channels and cultural diplomacy. Active measures also thought to deceive or distort the target's perception of reality. In brief, information operations and their aims are not new, but actors, techniques, and messages are updated for the digitally interconnected global information ecosystem. which leads us to social media becoming a new operational arena in which information channels are subject to greater speed, availability, and reach. US President Obama recently noted that social media has become a primary source of news and information for a growing number of people, making it a vulnerable space for manipulation and interference. It is important to note that the information environment can be distorted through numerous ways. Dr. Claire Wardle proposes seven forms of, the, of information disorder, as seen here on the right, to explain the complexity of this ecosystem. For example, clickbait headlines, false context, misleading or completely fabricated content can subvert how we consume information. Wardle emphasizes that anything with a kernel of truth is far more successful in terms of persuading and engaging people. And as we will see shortly, this is a particularly important observation. Coming to the narrative analysis, this presentation looks at Chinese, Russian, and Iranian official government accounts on Twitter. I want to mention that information operations may involve plenty of other actors, including state-owned media outlets and influencers and community, uh, conspiracy communities. Twitter is also just one of various platforms used for targeting international audiences. 
As an indication of the relevance of Twitter, the two graphics on the right show an uptick of Chinese and Iranian government accounts. The Oxford Internet Inter Institute found how with the beginning of the pandemic, Chinese diplomats increasingly use Twitter for public diplomacy efforts. The Atlantic Council tracked an increase of Iranian government accounts with an account creation spike in mid-2018, aligning with the US withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal. The narrative analysis focuses on content related to nuclear as well as WMD issues more broadly to capture the relevant online discourse. I will now present five key findings. I begin with an overarching and long-standing narrative, which is a depiction of the US as a serial violator of treaty commitments. We can observe this narrative throughout as it deliberately conflates bits of truth to spread misleading and false accusations. For example, on the left, we can see Russian and Chinese accounts exploiting US support for Ukrainian public health facilities for spreading disinformation about alleged biological military laboratories in Ukraine. With regard to the Iran nuclear deal, Iranian accounts often focus the US withdrawal decision as well as Western nuclear modernization to deflect attention from Iran's longstanding interest in nuclear weapons and to boost a moral standing compared to the West. Similarly, Chinese accounts have attack attacked the AUKUS partnership to denounce Western leadership in the area of nuclear non-proliferation and accuse the West of double standards, alleged arms race, and contempt of international law. This leads us to another common narrative which undermines the integrity and trust of international verification regimes with allegations of rigged institutions that only serve the geopolitical interest of the West. This narrative frequently points to past US intelligence failures, especially with regard to the US-led invasion of Iraq. It often does so in a conspiratorial manner with accusations of engineered intelligence, for instance, spreading disinformation about the white helmets in Syria working with terrorists to stage a chemical weapons provocation. Official accounts, especially Russian government accounts, complement accusations by misusing photos and videos, including misstating, misidentifying, or modifying satellite imagery. Manipulation is used to conduct false fact-checking and debunking of alleged Western fake news. For, for example, the Kremlin denies chemical attacks perpetrated in Syria. It is also now denying the evidence of atrocities against civilians in the town of Bucha, including claims that footage of bodies was staged. Russian accounts are also using fabricated information to accuse the West of staging WMD false flags in Ukraine, portraying the US and NATO as aggressive and escalatory. This includes fabricated scenarios Alleg allegedly prepared by the Pentagon. Iranian and Chinese accounts have also deflected from the Kremlin's aggression, referring to US evil policies or calling out the US for starting conflicts and wars around the world in the context of the Ukraine war. Lastly, as highlighted by the demise of the INF Treaty, Russian officials deny evidence of non-compliance, including the discrediting of any evidence as fake or conspiring against Russia, or by deflecting, by making false counter accusations. And to, to wrap up, the findings point to a contested online information environment with Twitter being used as a foreign policy tool of people-to-people -to -people diplomacy, which seeks to distort the discourse on nuclear and WMD issues. This includes communication official communications alongside seemingly informal reflections from high-level officials. The observations show similar tactics and messaging, notably the spread of anti-Western and anti-hegemonic agendas. All three governments make heavy use of whataboutism, the notion that the, act the activities of the West would be no different and therefore any condemnation of Russian, Chinese or Iranian actions would just deflect Western double standards or hypocrisy. Secondly, governments use gaslighting by flooding the information space with deceptive, decontextualized, or manipulated content, advancing idea in an, an idea that there is no objective truth. Third, all three actors exaggerate their own moral authority.
For example, narratives appropriate international norm building, such as creating an alleged consensus among the international community to elevate their status and vilify the US. Coming to my recommendations, in view of the contestation of, inform of information, a NATO ally should be able to navigate associated risk for WMD diplomacy. With regard to verification, allies should seek to prevent toxic distrust and loss of faith in any information. A first step should be the development of transparent, credible, and professionalized OSINT capabilities. Currently, there is a lot of volunteer-led crowdsourced information gathering, but limited knowledge about nuclear issues and context. Collaborative efforts with the research community and the commercial sector could advance codes of conduct, peer review processes, and standards of evidence. With regard to allied strategic communication, both STRATCOM teams and the intelligence communities should improve situational awareness via social media monitoring capabilities. For example, for example enabling systems for cross-platform and real-time monitoring. Such efforts should help to detect patterns of tactics and messages to anticipate communication needs. Further, to avoid a debunking backlash, STRATCOM should enforce clear policies to communicate transparent and factual information early on. This is to say that counter-narrative strategies and just revealing something is false or misleading often end up drawing attention to it or giving a narrative more oxygen. Lastly, in view of the complexity and much needed nuance of the, of the topic, allies should embrace a whole of government approach rooted in building societal resilience. This effort should focus digital literacy, better public knowledge about nuclear issues, and the inclusion of more diverse voices in nuclear debates overall. And with these thoughts and recommendations, um, this is, I finalize my presentation. Uh, for those of you interested, I have also included a list of keywords queried for um, to, to scope the um, online information environment on Twitter. But as I said, this was a qualitative scoping exercise, not a quantitative analysis. But I'm happy to elaborate further during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sarah, and for, I think, unraveling the, the phenomenon of Twitter diplomacy that we've seen in the past couple of years. Uh, we'll go to Lucy next. Hi, everyone. So I'm Lucy, and I'm going to be trying to answer the question, are nuclear breakout times an effective way of measuring a country's proliferation risk? So I'm going to go through first what nuclear breakout times are and why we use them. I'm then going to go into a specific case study, so probably the only case study that people really know about, and that's the JCPOA, or Iran nuclear deal. I'm then going to talk about the benefits and limitations that I see with breakout times, and then I'll end with, are they effective? So what is a nuclear breakout time? So it's the length of time that it would take a country or state to produce enough weapons-grade uranium to make a single nuclear bomb. So how much is this? The IAEA um, defines this a significant quantity as 25 kilograms of highly enriched uranium. Now, a significant quantity is defined as the approximate amount of material for which the possibility of manufacturing a nuclear explosive device cannot be ruled out. So while it's not specifically stating that it is the amount of material for one um, nuclear weapon, um, this is kind of the value that people usually use. So the calculation for breakout time will depend on a variety of different things, and this will be the type of centrifuges that are used to enrich the uranium to increase the amount of uranium-235, the efficiency and configuration of these machines, and then the size and enrichment levels of the current stockpile. Because obviously if the country already has some highly enriched uranium, then it's going to need to make less in order to get that 25 kilograms. So why do we use breakout times? It is a quantitative estimate of a country's capability to produce fissile material. So it's kind of a barometer of the time that it would take a country to produce a nuclear weapon and then an indication of whether the diplomatic progress um, is good enough in order to, pre to prevent that possibility. 
so it can inform your response time for proliferation threats. So, for example, if you're going in to discuss some sanctions and safeguards that you want to put in place in order to prevent a country from proliferating, it's really good to have a number as a benchmark and give you something tangible to talk to. Um, but it is important to ensure that they are right and that they're used in the right context if you're using them for these discussions. So now on to Iran, which is, if you Google breakout times, you'll basically only find stuff about Iran as that is the biggest thing going on in the world right now in terms of nuclear breakout. So Iran has signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty, under which it is not recognized as a nuclear weapon state. So this means that it should not be acquiring um, nuclear material for anything other than peaceful purposes. So it's well within its rights to enrich uranium up to 3.67%, which is the limit for peaceful uses, so for nuclear power, etc. Um, however, in 2002, some clandestine nuclear facilities were discovered, um, and then in 2015, the IAEA's Possible Military Dimensions Report concluded that Iran had carried out a range of activities um, relevant to the development of a nuclear explosive device. So they said they found up to 2003 there was a structured nuclear program in Iran, and then between 2003 and 2009, it was sort of continued in a dispersed fashion. So Iran had broken its commitments under the NPT. And this is what led on to the Iran nuclear deal. So the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or the Iran nuclear deal, is an agreement that was reached by Iran and the P5 plus one on the 14th of July 2015. And it was then implemented the year after. Um, the P5 plus one, um, it's Russia, the US, France, China, the UK, and then the plus one is Germany. Um, and under this agreement, Iran agreed to limit its sensitive nuclear activities and allow international inspectors in to monitor them. Um, and in exchange for this, some of the economic sanctions that had been placed on Iran were lifted. So Iran actually lost $118 billion in oil revenue between 2012 and 2016. So you can see why they would have been keen to get in on the deal. Um, the US did withdraw from the JCPOA, as I'm sure you're aware, in 2018, but it's currently being renegotiated. So this sort of leads me on to some of the limitations that I see with breakout times. Um, I've got two articles to kind of describe this. Um, and it's to do with the way that breakout times are communicated. So the article on the left is from Reuters. And it says, Israel sees six-month Iran nuclear breakout longer than Blinken projection. So as you know, Anthony Blinken is the US Secretary of State. So it's talking about the breakout times that were stated by Israel and the US at the same time. So Israel was saying the breakout time is six months, and the article goes on to say that the US, or the Blinken projection, is three months. So two completely different breakout times being given at the same point in time. Um, so this is one of the issues, is there isn't a standard calculation for breakout times. It is kind of a bit open to interpretation. Technically, if you have the right access to data, then if you're calculating and putting in the same factors, you should get the same number. But it is quite clear when you start looking into it that politics does come into play in the calculation that you would think is purely scientific. Um, so obviously, if you're going into discussions about sanctions and safeguards, it, it is a bit of an issue if different countries are predicting different values and different timescales. Then on the right, I have an article from the Times of Israel, and that says, White House says Iran is a few weeks or less from bomb breakout. And this is another issue I see with breakout times is that they can be miscommunicated and potentially used for fear-mongering. So it's quite a statement title. And if I didn't know anything about breakout times, I would probably think that meant that Iran was a few weeks or less from having a whole nuclear weapon, whereas that's not what nuclear breakout times are talking about. It's talking about how close they are to having the material to produce a nuclear weapon. So I think if miscommunicated, it can cause problems and it can be quite scary if you don't know um, and you don't have the context for it. So on to a sort of summary of the pros and cons I see with breakouts. So on the pro side, it is useful to have a benchmark. If you're going into discussions, it's really good to have something that you can talk to and something that you can base your discussions around. Um, the quantities taken into account are mostly easy to estimate. So if you have the right access to the data and you have the right data, then all of the values such as the amount of nuclear material they have, the number of centuries they have, are all quite easy to estimate, and it should be quite a simple calculation, in theory. Um, producing enough weapons-grade material is a significant step in producing a weapon, so although, as I said, 
breakout times don't take into account the whole process of producing a weapon, having the nuclear material is a huge step. If you don't have that, then you're not going to have a weapon. So it is significant. And my final pro is what is the alternative, which is something that I did start looking into. Um, when you start researching it, it, it can be quite hard to incorporate other factors into the equation because um, they're not necessarily quantitative. So what is the alternative and have we got the best solution already? Then on the con side, it is a measure of technical capability and not intent. So just because a country can produce a nuclear weapon, it doesn't mean that they will. A good example of this is Japan. So Japan have good nuclear technology. I imagine if you calculate their breakout time, I did try and Google it and not much came up. Um, but clearly that shows that we're not concerned about Japan. Um, I imagine their breakout time would be reasonably short, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. We're not concerned about Jap Japan proliferating. Um, so just because, say, two countries have a breakout time of three months, it doesn't mean that they're equally likely to break out. So just taking that value of three months on its own or whatever, how many months, it doesn't mean anything by itself, and that's why you need to put it into context. There is no inclusion of other aspects of weapons development. So as I said, it doesn't include any of the other parts of the process that go into producing a weapon, the explosive technology and all the other things that go into it. Um, it can be politicised and used for fear-mongering, as I showed on the Times of Israel article. Um, the headlines that come with it can be quite scary, and if miscommunicated, it can cause problems. And also, the calculation greatly depends on the input data. So if you don't have the right access to data, then you're making estimations, and that can cause quite large variations in the result that you get. So to sort of bring everything together, are nuclear breakout times an effective way of measuring a country's proliferation risk? So proliferation risk or threat is sort of made up of three parts. So capability, intent, and opportunity. Breakout times can tell you a little bit about a country's capability. They can't really tell you anything about their intent and they can't really tell you about the opportunity that they have. So it's not the whole picture by itself. And this is why I say it is a useful tool, but only effective when contextualized. Breakout times do not take into account the variety of other factors that will also influence proliferation risk, for example, politics. Um, and also the result is highly dependent on the accuracy of the input data. Um, and I think also you have to ask yourself, why do we want a more accurate breakout time? So when you're looking at how they're used, they're used in order to drive political action and to make sure that states and countries put in place appropriate sanctions and safeguards in order to prevent proliferation. Um, so you kind of just need a ballpark figure and you don't really want a super long breakout time anyway because that won't drive political action. It won't make politicians want to put sanctions in place. Um, I think going into this as a physicist, I really wanted to come out of it with a specific value that I could be like, I'm going to have an accurate number and I'm going to have exactly how long it takes a country to make um, the fissile material. It's gonna, I'm going to work out exactly how long it's going to take them to have a whole weapon. But through this journey of research, I've kind of realised that there are so many different factors that go into this sort of thought process, it's such a grey area, you can't just have a black or white number and you can't just have a single number that says this is how long a country is from proliferating because there are just too many factors to take into account. Um, so it has been interesting, um, but I didn't necessarily get to a single value like I wanted to, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for listening and I'll have you to take questions in a minute. Today I will be presenting on strategic stability and the role of space, challenges and opportunities. So why this topic? Outer space is one domain that is often missing in the discourse around strategic stability. However, the overall stability of the space domain is becoming a central component of global stability in times of crisis. My initial interest in this topic stemmed from the role of nuclear weapons in geopolitics. Nuclear dynamics have always informed and shaped key concepts of deterrence and stability. For example, mutually assured destruction. What I became intrigued about is what the removal or the threat of removal of a support network could mean for the cost-benefit calculation of a potential attacker and what this would mean for the strategic thought process in reacting to the attack. Whilst there exists a whole array of kinetic and non-kinetic capabilities which threaten space assets, this presentation considers the threat of cyber attacks against ISR systems, specifically early warning satellites. Okay. 
Um, my line of argument is that in order to maintain strategic stability, bridging the gap between security concerns, diplomacy, and education is central. This presentation will cover an overview of my research, beginning, beginning with brief definitions of key terms and context, before moving on to focus on the key challenges of cyber threats, two early warning signals, and the opportunities provided through policy. Um, from my research, I found that all too often, key terminology was not consistently used and was creating, if you like, extra noise in an already complex domain. Strategic stability means different things for different states, and the definition of strategic stability is a contested subject. Its, or its origins date back to the Cold War, and it was typically associated with maintaining a survivable nuclear second strike capability. The definition has become broader, as reflected in the Nuclear Posture Review of the US, to include non-nuclear capabilities such as advanced conventional weapons, emerging technology, especially cyber capabilities, as factors affecting crisis stability and arms race stability. One key point I'd like to emphasize is that space has always been a militarized domain and that threats against satellites are not a new phenomenon. Ever since the placing in orbit of the first satellite in 1957, techniques have persistently been pursued to harm or interrupt or compromise their services. So what is strategic stability in the context of space and what has changed? The concept of dual use systems is contested and will be understood as used by both nuclear and non-nuclear forces and military and civilian operators. Systems linked to command and control are also important for tactical and strategic operations. There is no definition between the two, making entanglement a key risk. What has also changed is the increase in the number of satellites in space and the increased and divergent number of actors operating in space. As everyone in this room will know, there are multiple challenges around strategic stability in satellites. However, the main one I'll be focusing on is cyber attacks. Cyber attacks are notoriously difficult to attribute, with false flag operations commonly used and connections between apparently non-state actors and national governments difficult to establish. Tools of cyberware are largely non-physical and therefore easier to conceal than conventional forces, making it difficult for actors to assess each other's capabilities. These factors are further complicated and the understanding of a threat and the ability to read and interpret signals. So where does ISR fit in? A key function of ISR capabilities, that is intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, is providing an early warning signal. These satellites are a critical node for many incidents, as they are the first line of defense. Infrared early warning sensors are heat-detecting radars, which detect missile, missiles, such as ICBMs and SLBMs. This allows the state to detect incoming attacks and allow the sufficient time to react. Interference by cyber attacks on an early warning satellite could be understood as an indicator of war and raise concerns about the survivability of such assets. However, they are also dual use in function, providing non-military support, for example, tracking wildfires. Targeting such space assets has grown in recent years as a way to deafen and blind competition or adversaries. Understanding the relationship between space and maintaining strategic stability should therefore not be overlooked. Any space asset which, if disturbed, leads to a break in command and control can threaten to be detrimental to the preservation of strategic stability. So, so cyber refers to software attacks. Cyber threats to ISR here are discussed here, not because they're one of the most military threatening of emerging technologies, but rather because they demonstrate the, the complexities around strategic stability and the amount of uncertainty and impact they have on arms races, crises, and international politics more generally. A Chatham House report stated, cyber attacks on satellites would undermine the integrity of strategic weapon systems, destabilize the deterrence relationship, and obfuscate the originator of an attack. Whilst there is no verified record of such an attack on an early warning satellite having taken place to date, the implication of a potentially compromised early warning signal is captured more accurately by recent events in Ukraine. In March, there was an alleged attack by a cyber group of hackers who had supposedly taken down Russian satellite operations. The Roskomos chief, Rogozin, said that any cyber attacks on the country's satellite would be considered a cause for war, while simultaneously denying that any cyber attack had compromised the system. What is clear is that there would be a potentially high cost if such attacks were to take place as reflected in the comments of Chris Painter, the former government coordinator for cyber policy, who commented that blinding nuclear command and control or early warning satellites could be very destabilizing. 
The conversation around how such a tax should be interpreted and what a proportional reaction would be is, is a key area which needs to be addressed in order to avoid inadvertent crisis escalation or misattribution. Here you can see a diagram with two key threats posed by cyber attacks, being faulty and counterfeit microelectronics and spoofing and their potential impact on the decision-making process and strategic implications of such an attack. Faulty and counterfeit microelectronics. The technology used for space assets is often bought off the shelf, just as with all electronic devices, there could be a backdoor present in one of the many thousands of components in a single satellite, allowing cyber attacks hidden access. Such backdoors have already been found in Russian software packages and Chinese electronics used by aerospace, US aerospace companies. Spoofing. This is the manipulation of information being exchanged in communication, which reduces the integrity of data collected. Spoofing goes beyond jamming to distort or replace the signal with a false signal. Policy influencers and policymakers are struggling to grasp the full impact of cyber vulnerabilities in the context of both space-based assets and strategic systems. It is difficult to measure or predict the exact extent of such attacks, since they could also allow for follow-up attacks on other vectors. So what could be compromised from these attacks? Interference to the early warning signal could lead to faulty assessments and faulty responses to threats. Decision makers may not be able to send necessary orders down chains of command. There may be loss of situational awareness also contributing to faulty decision making. And decisions based on faulty information may lead to a trigger or crisis escalation or decrease the threshold for a conflict. Having explored the challenges of such attacks, I will now turn to focus on the opportunities offered through policy. The argument I centralize is that the extent of technologies themselves is not the key way forward. It is unrealistic that these technologies will not continue to advance in maturity. We need to really focus on addressing behaviors since we already know that perception and assumptions are key to a balanced crisis management. The key policy areas which I have found most valuable we're focusing on diplomacy, education investment, and supply chain integrity. Okay. Um, in an increasingly complex environment where multi-domain interconnectedness and novel threats pose challenges to international stability, alliance commitments are becoming of increased importance. There is an increased need for cooperation and multilateral unity in order to avoid geopolitical tensions overspilling into space or vice versa. This requires for greater attention to diplomatic efforts. And this effort needs to be top down with diplomatic engagement, treaty negotiations and confidence building measures to help foster and strengthen international norms to create a joint understanding and clarity in the cost benefit analysis of any such attack. Even the process of treaty building is an important step for starting necessary debates around issues and sharing concerns. Education. Investment in education is a central component to addressing the challenges which we are facing. Experts in government are vital and the lack of technical expertise can set back efforts. Investment in training should be focused within defense professionals but also look to the future workforce. We need a diversified and skilled workforce to build and invest in young talent and invest in secondary school students as well as university students and offer opportunities in relevant ongoing professional training. We need to avoid mistakes by learning from nuclear dilemmas of the past, such as Petrov's. Being aware of the limits of information and data and having an understanding of what the implications could be will allow for human judgment and the ability to maneuver in such high stakes situations to formulate a more effective and nuanced response. And lastly, supply chain integrity. Supply chain integrity is imperative for reliable military systems. We should ensure that contractors who rely on commercial standards follow cybersecurity arrangements and consider ensuring that commercial contracts meet military protection standards in order to mitigate the risks posed by the military's use of commercial space assets. Enhanced communication and tighter cooperation between government and the private sector will prove crucial in bolstering defense in this area. More arrangements like the information sharing and analysis centers, which facilitate intelligence sharing on cyber threats between the public and private sector are key. Reviewing and monitoring is one of the key elements, and of course, there are some existing frameworks and systems, but compliance issues and accessibility, accessibility issues limit their efficacy. There is currently no existing international body which yet monetizes and verifies compliance of companies and production lines. 
So to round up, what are the key takeaways? To acknowledge the complexity and subjectivity of the threat of cyber attacks on strategic stability, to focus on understanding and bridging the domestic knowledge gap, and focus on communication as being siloed, both within governments, within alliances, and within industry partners. Initiatives addressing this need to be expanded upon. On a domestic and an international level, we need to improve the inadequate understanding of what crisis escalation looks like in this domain, and we need to work towards formulating common international, proportional and coordinated responses, and communicating with potential adversaries about the political costs of such cyber attacks. Thank you very much.